In December 1944, 400 men of the 1st British Airborne Division paraded at Buckingham Palace to receive the grateful thanks from their king and countrymen. Although they paraded as heroes, victors they were not. They were some of the survivors of a whole airborne division of over 10,000 men lost during one of the most audacious and ultimately controversial battles of the Second World War, Arnhem. Today, the bridge at Arnhem is a potent reminder of the courage and sacrifice of the men of the British 1st Airborne Division. And although the area immediately around the bridge is very different to how it was in 1944, there are plenty of reminders of the paratroopers' presence. Not surprisingly, the dramatic events that took place around this area still hold a tremendous fascination for people today, many of whom were not even born when the 1st Airborne Division arrived here on the evening of Sunday, September the 17th, 1944. This is the road bridge at Arnhem and is the final objective of the 1st Airborne Division. It was reached by, only by Headquarters 1st Parachute Brigade, by the 2nd Parachute Battalion with two companies, plus C Company of the 3rd Parachute Battalion and some other minor units, a mix of Royal Engineers, a Royal Army Service Corps, Royal Army Ordnance Corps uh, and Royal Signals. Total by the Monday morning, the 18th of September, probably between six and 700 men, although really records are difficult to get accurately. The bridge itself had been destroyed at the start of the war in 1940 and rebuilt by the Germans and the Dutch, only completed and reopened in April 1944, whereupon we paid a short visit in September 1944, and the bridge was destroyed yet again uh, by the Royal Air Force in October 1944 and rebuilt following the war. But the ramps leading up to the bridge and the piles are the originals. It's only the superstructure that has been replaced to replicate the original bridge, and it's now called the John Frost Bridge. The origins of the Battle of Arnhem are found in the Battle of Normandy, which reached its climax in August 1944. The landings on the beaches in northern France on D-Day, June 6, 1944, had been met with stiff resistance by the Germans. But after several months of hard fighting, their morale collapsed. Of the 38 German divisions committed to Normandy, 25 were completely destroyed, many of them in the Falaise pocket to the southeast of Caen. Hundreds of thousands of men were killed, wounded or captured. Much of the credit for this victory went to Field Marshal Sir Bernard Montgomery. But there were several American commanders who felt that Montgomery's conduct had been profoundly suspect and that the Allies' success in Normandy was despite his presence, not because of him. Such sentiments were symptomatic of crumbling relations between senior Allied commanders as they jockeyed to secure their own futures. But with the Germans in full flight, heading north into Belgium and Holland, there was a general euphoria that Germany was as good as beaten. The rapid advance of the Allies, however, was beginning to show signs of slowing down as supply lines became increasingly stretched. With the supply crisis and disputes over strategy worsening, the Allies' Supreme Commander, General Dwight D. Eisenhower, placed the recently formed 1st Allied Airborne Army under the command of Montgomery's 21st Army Group. Montgomery was determined that it would be his 21st Army Group that delivered the killer blow. And it was from the tangle of conflicting interests that an airborne solution, Operation Market Garden, started to emerge. The three airborne divisions of the 1st Allied Airborne Army were to be dropped at vital river crossings at Eindhoven, Nijmegen and Arnhem, an area of 60 miles from top to bottom. At the same time, the British 2nd Army, with 30 corps in the lead, would push north to relieve the airborne soldiers. With the river crossings secure, the Allies would then be able to either cut Holland in two, trapping vast numbers of Germans in the west, or swing east and attack the Ruhr region from the north. They would then link up with Major General Hodges' 1st U.S. Army, advancing up from the south through the Ardennes. As the Ruhr was the industrial heart of the German war machine, its fall was expected to remove the Nazis' capacity for waging war. In fact, it was felt that the war would all be over by Christmas. 
By any standards, it was a bold and ambitious plan, and the operation was given the go-ahead on September the 10th. But it was to commence on September the 17th. This left just seven days to prepare for the largest airborne operation in history. To put the timescale into perspective, the Normandy invasion took six months of planning and used half the number of men allocated to Market Garden. The seeds of disaster were sown long before the troops began boarding their aircraft under clear sunny skies on Sunday, September the 17th. A shortage of aircraft meant that the airborne army could not be dropped in one lift. Priority was given to the two US airborne divisions, the 82nd and 101st, as they would be relieved more quickly by the advancing 30 Corps. But it would take three lifts over three days to get all the men of the 1st British Airborne Division in place. And they were going to be expected to hold their objective, the bridge at Arnhem, 60 miles to the north of 30 Corps, 60 miles behind enemy lines. Well, it was a difficult time. Um, 6th Airborne Division uh, had the luxury of um, three months or so of preparation for, for the job. We were given 10 days and had to make do with that. And um, um, it was laid down as a matter of principle. As a result of the previous operations, airborne operations that we'd undertaken, and indeed what the enemy had done in Crete, that the art of parachuting had to be done on the on the actual objective, or within a mile or two of the objective. Otherwise, it was unlikely to work very well. And this became um, a principle that really should never be broken. But um, when the time came for Arnhem, I'm afraid it was broken. We were given a, a landing zone, a beautiful landing zone, much like Salisbury Plain, I suppose, about eight miles from, from uh, the bridge, which was our objective with an enormous forest, a very thick forest, and a large town before you actually got to the bridge. The place chosen for the drop was a small town some eight miles to the west of Arnhem, Oosterbeek. Today the area is much the same as it was in 1944. In the decades before the Second World War it had become popular with retired civil servants and merchants who after years of colonial service sought the tranquility of the town's leafy glades and thoroughfares. Even in September 1944 it seemed an unlikely place for a battle. Well, my parents were living in an area quite far away from Osterbeek, but they had to flee for the Germans because uh, they wanted to take my father as a hostage. And my parents decided to go to Eusterbeek because they thought, well, this is such a lovely, quiet and peaceful village. Nothing will happen there. So they, uh, they went to Eusterbeek and they uh, were hiding in the house of my grandparents, which is uh, the big house over there. It's still standing. And um, uh, then suddenly uh, the first British Airborne Division dropped and they um, were in the middle of a battle. The British plan was for a hundred men of the reconnaissance squadron who were mounted in jeeps to use their speed and dash to the bridge at Arnhem. They were to hold it until the first para brigade arrived on foot several hours later. The paras were to take three different routes to the bridge. The first battalion was to follow the most northern route taken by the reconnaissance squadron, codenamed Leopard. Their objective was to capture some high ground to the north of Arnhem. 3rd Battalion was to take the middle route to the bridge, Tiger, and the 2nd Battalion would take the route along the river, codenamed Lion. The 2nd Battalion was also to take the railway bridge and cross over to the southern bank, enabling the bridge at Arnhem to be attacked from both ends. The powers would be reinforced by the Gliderborn Air Landing Brigade, whose task was also to secure the landing zones for the second drop. The second drop would bring in the rest of the air landing brigade and divisional units that had been unable to go on the first lift. Finally, a third lift would bring in the Polish brigade under Major General Sozobowski, who was due to land south of the river. By that time, 30 Corps would be in the area. All being well, the Polish brigade would occupy the positions to the east of Arnhem, the 1st Air Landing Brigade would be in position to the west. 
the 4th Para Brigade to the north, while the 1st Para Brigade would be withdrawn into reserve, holding the bridge itself and areas to the south. That was the plan. It was assumed that German defences in the area were virtually non-existent, and so the plan's great flaw, the distance from the dropping zone to the bridge, would not present a problem. But the Germans were far from beaten. But Second Army intelligence officers chose to ignore warnings from the Dutch resistance that no less than two SS Panzer divisions had moved into the area to refit and recuperate after the poundings they'd received in Normandy. They would have their revenge. But thoughts of defeat were far from the airborne soldiers' minds as the enormous Skytrain of 3,500 aircraft headed out for continental Europe from airfields all over England. The aircraft carrying the 82nd and 101st U.S. Airborne Divisions were to take a southern route into Holland. The 101st U.S. Airborne Division was to secure the bridges from Eindhoven to Weigel. The 82nd U.S. Airborne Division was to secure the bridges from Graaf to Nijmegen, as well as the Grusbeck Heights, which was an area of high ground overlooking the Lower Rhine. It was feared that the Germans might mount a counterattack through the heights. Meanwhile, the British 1st Airborne Division was taking a more northerly route. Initially, there was little opposition as the first troops began to land on Dutch soil just before 1 p.m. We're on the, the dropping and landing zones, which were used on the first day by the 1st Parachute Brigade and by the Air Landing Brigade to deposit themselves in this part of Holland and by the headquarters, or the bulk of the headquarters, of the 1st Airborne Division. Behind me is dropping zone X-ray. It was the dropping zone onto which first landed a platoon of the Independent Parachute Company to place its Eureka beacons and to mark out the panels or lay out the marker panels for the parachutists who would land a short while afterwards. And when they did arrive, the parachutists would begin dropping from their Dakota aircraft way down to the south, to the bottom end of this dropping zone with each succeeding wave of aircraft as it came in, dropping its paratroopers further and further north until the last sticks would land in the northern part of the dropping zone here, to the right as I'm looking at it, and to the left of this road, Telefonsweg, or Telephone Street, or Telephone Way, which runs up the centre of the uh, dropping zone, and which the pilots who were coming in, both towing gliders and dropping parachutists, used as a datum point to get their positioning to get their line correct. Parachutists jumping from an aircraft, there will be 19 in a Dakota, will be laden with something in the region of 100 to 120 pounds in weight. Not, not just the kit that they were carrying, the rucksacks they were carrying, the webbing and the, and the stores, but their clothing, their boots and everything else which accumulated to this considerable weight for the average infantryman of something like 110 to 115 pounds. But if you were a mortarman or a radio man or a medium machine gunner, you were of course carrying very much more. And you landed on what was arable land, partly ploughed, been used for crops, soft soil. So the first thing you do when you hit the ground is you suddenly find it's actually really quite difficult to run because your boots are getting clogged up and sinking in to the soil as you try and move to the rendezvous, which were marked in coloured smoke by men of your own battalion, by men of your own unit, and by men of the independent parachute company as well. When a parachutist exited the aircraft, he had a very short space of time in which to release from around his waist uh, the rope which held a kind of a container, which uh, he hung some 15 feet below him, containing those things he couldn't get on his back, basically, because there was a parachute there. Uh, they would be perhaps a weapon, more ammunition, uh, and, and, and equipment that he would be wanting to use. And in the time between him exiting the aircraft, his parachute deploying and him checking that, and him hitting the ground, which was only 10 to 15 seconds, he would have to lower this kit bag, at the 15 feet or so, on the end of a piece of rope that was attached to his waist, uh, so that it would land first, and then he would subsequently hit the ground after it, not to detach it from your leg or your waist and to land with it still hitched up, as it were, uh, invited a broken leg, basically. Uh, that was OK for the first parachutist to jump, but when a Dakota was dropping parachute soldiers 
it went into a kind of a, a stalling glide. It slowed its speed right down to the point where it was only just about remaining airborne. So effectively, while they may have started jumping at 600 feet when the first parachutist jumped from an aircraft, they were only at 500 feet by the time the 19th one got out, and he had really rather less time to sort out his airborne administration than the chap who jumped first. And so there was an awful lot of fumbling at wastes going on up there as people came down and eventually struck the ground. It was a perfect drop uh, as far as the parachutists were concerned. Some people said the best they'd ever done and certainly the casualties probably less than they would experience on an exercise uh, in training. And from here the three battalions went in their, in their three separate directions although the routes they were following were essentially parallel but they were some distance apart. And remember, these were airborne soldiers, extremely fit, very aggressive, but carrying huge weights. And really, therefore, their speed and their flexibility was limited to the pace at which they could move, carrying those weights over the distances that they were supposed to be carrying. The gliders, of course, landed before the parachutists, some 20 minutes or so. And the first gliders to come in would be those of the Air Landing Brigade, which overflew this area because their landing zone is beyond us and further to the north. What came in here on the landing zone to the east of this dropping zone on which we're standing were those gliders which brought in divisional headquarters, divisional headquarters equipment, heavy equipment which couldn't be parachuted, such as guns, two batteries of artillery, for example, of the 1st Air Landing Light Regiment, anti-tank weapons and various other pieces of equipment together also with the couple of Bren gun carriers that each parachute battalion had on its establishment. Principally hawser gliders, but also some Hamilcar gliders coming in on this landing zone. Now the difficulty the glider pilots faced on this landing zone was that having been launched about three miles out, released their toes at a height of about three to 4,000 feet, they were going to come straight in to the landing zone. I'm not a glider pilot, but I'm told that gliders but when a pilot is trying to land a glider, he quite likes to come in to the line of his landing at about 90 degrees, make a turn left or right to get himself settled and pick up a datum point which allows him to land effectively. The people coming from the south landing on the landing zone here uh, didn't have that opportunity. They were coming straight in tactically, diving in very fast, off an approach, trying to make sure they could avoid any potential enemy fire against them. And so there was a tendency for the early gliders when they landed, for all the gliders when they landed, to overshoot the point that they'd picked to land at. And of course, for those that landed in the north of the landing zone, they managed to embed themselves, eight or nine of them, in trees at the top end of the landing zone, and that caused a certain amount of damage. There was also a certain amount of damage caused amongst the Hamilcar gliders, and it was two of them, where not having a nose wheel, but the wheels of the glider, and it's a very heavy glider, being underneath the wings, when they hit this very soft soil, there was a tendency for the nose to bang down, for the glider to do a, a sort of a forward roll and land on its back, destroy the equipment or damage the equipment beyond repair that was inside it. And, and more importantly, perhaps, because the cockpit sat on top of the Hamilcar glider, the pilots uh, were either killed or very seriously injured with, with significant crush injuries. So not easy to land, certainly the bigger gliders, on this, this very soft and very sandy soil on the, uh, in the fields um, around Renkham Heath. Further south, at Joe's Bridge, which crosses the Merseysco Canal on the Dutch-Belgian border, 30 Corps began its advance north. In 1944, there was only one real road to Arnhem and the plan was to try and channel some 30,000 vehicles along it in three days. Leading the column was the Guards' Armoured Division, who made good progress, supported by overwhelming Allied firepower. By 7.30 in the evening, the division halted at Vulkansvard and prepared to rest for the night as ordered rather than press on. The consequences were to be catastrophic for the men of the 1st Airborne Division, who had already experienced its first major setback. This track saw things happening, important things, over the first three days of the battle. On the first day, it was the route that was to be followed by the reconnaissance squadron, whose task was to leave the landing zones as swiftly as it could, 
and race as fast as it could to the Arnhem Road Bridge and hold it whilst the infantry following up much more slowly on foot arrived at the bridge to set up a proper defensive perimeter. But they left the dropping zone late for reasons which really are inexplicable and in the time that it took them to leave the point at which they'd landed, the Germans had put up a blocking position which almost by coincidence placed a platoon straddling this track. They were on the high ground to the left of the track and they were up on the railway embankment to the right of the track. And they were part of a battalion commanded by Major Sepp Kraft which lay principally on the south side of the railway line to my right and which was effectively the first German opposition uh, against which the 1st Airborne Division found itself pitted. The lead section of C Troop of the Reconnaissance Squadron was racing down this road leading the advance to the bridge. The front vehicle, the section commander, Lieutenant Peter Bucknell, had gone on some distance ahead and Sergeant McGregor with his jeep was trying to catch the officer up when he heard machine gun fire in the distance and out of his sight. Not sure what had happened to his officer, he speeded up his vehicle and was racing down this track towards he knew not what, except that there'd been some firing and heavy machine gun firing up ahead. And as he approached through the trees, which in those days were rather less dense than they are today, he came out into a piece of open ground by a cutting to the right and to the left was a piece of high ground and to the right was the railway embankment and his vehicle was shot at by heavy machine gun fire coming either from the railway embankment to my right from the high ground to my left or from both and the soldiers in it uh, did what they would always do under those circumstances they dismounted instantly they tried to identify where the enemy were they found themselves overpowered by an enemy who was carrying much more firepower than they were capable of deploying and in a very short space of time they were all wounded apart from Sergeant McGregor who was killed and they were subsequently taken prisoner. Other elements of the reconnaissance squadron trying to get up to here to find out what was going on got involved in the melee here but effectively lightly equipped as they were they were no match for the albeit very small but powerfully armed German force probably in platoon strength against which they found themselves pitted. It was on this hill, to the left of the track down which the recce squadron was approaching, that Sepp Kraft put part of his reserve platoon. And it was from trenches rather like this one that German soldiers were able to look down on the track and watch the vehicles of the reconnaissance squadron approach. And of course, in those days, very much less foliage very much lower density of trees and so therefore their vision, their sight of what was going on, their ability to see what was going on, very much greater than it would appear uh, at the moment. And it was from a trench like this or trenches like this that the first machine gun fire was put down onto those jeeps to stop them and subsequently it was from this trench or trenches like it from which the mortar fire was directed from the mortar positions of Sepp Kraft's battalion which lay to the south of the railway line. It was from this position and one like it on the railway embankment that the tip of the spear of 1st Airborne Division was blunted, that the recce squadron was halted and one of the major planks of Urquhart's plan which was to get the recce squadron to the bridge to hold it until 1st Parachute Brigade arrived on that first evening was prevented from happening. It was in a sense the point at which things began to go downhill and they'd barely landed an hour by the time it happened. The failure of the recce squadron's coup de main was to have far-reaching consequences. First Parachute Brigade Commander Brigadier Lathbury, on hearing the news, set off by jeep to inform his battalion commanders that there would be no friendly force waiting for them at the bridge, but that they should press on with all speed. Meanwhile, the division's headquarters, which had been set up in the Hartenstein Hotel, was already experiencing radio problems. The, the, the main misgiving we had because, um, uh, was the business of communications. Uh, all our radios were based on the fact that um, within about a three-mile circle, 
which is what they said, that the Airborne Division would always land within that, uh, that sort of diameter of place to the objective, um, we'd be fine. But um, our radios didn't work more than about three or four miles. And when the um, first parachute brigade, on, after landing, went off uh, towards the bridge and about halfway along, they faded out. Yeah, there was a factor which contributed to the, uh, the bad commu radio communications. First of all, the sets were too light, too weak. And then secondly, which, uh, a thing which the British didn't know, is that the, the sand here contains a lot of iron and that gives static. And even today, the Dutch army uh, doing an exercise nearby on Ginkel Heath has trouble and until I got cable at home I couldn't listen to the radio. The division's commander, Major General Urquhart, did not know if Lathbury was aware of the recce squadron's fate and so he also set off in a jeep to try and find Lathbury, who was also his deputy, and urge him on. They eventually met up while Lathbury was visiting the 3rd Battalion. But they were to find their return route blocked by the growing German defences leaving the division without its commander and deputy for the next two days. But on that first day, the Germans' chain of command also suffered a major setback. This very busy main road leading into Arnhem, known as Utrechtsweg, was, uh, in September 1944, the route being followed by the 3rd Parachute Battalion as it made its way to the bridge on the first day of the battle. As the lead platoon came level with the junction immediately behind me here, Major General Kusin appeared from up the road <coughs> and went to turn left along Utrechtsweg back into Arnhem, where he was the Arnhem town commandant, the local garrison commander. Of course, he ran in to the soldiers of the 3rd Parachute Battalion and his vehicle was very badly shot up and he and all the occupants were killed. The real significance of Kusin's death, however, is that he was the Arnhem town commandant. He was actually the person who commanded the guard force or the soldiers who would guard the bridge at Arnhem. And because of his death at this junction, at somewhere around five o'clock in the evening of the 17th September, when John Frost's battalion arrived at the bridge at eight o'clock that night, it was virtually unguarded. And part of the reason was that the commander who would be giving those orders, who would be making that appreciation, who would be liaising with Bittrich's 2nd Panzer SS Corps to make sure garrison troops fulfilled their proper function as part of the overall plan of defeating the airborne attempt to get to the bridge, wasn't there. And in a sense, he had made the same mistake that Urquhart even then was already making, getting a long way forward, trying to find out what was going on with the forward troops, getting himself embroiled in the battle, and in this case, having himself killed and unable, therefore, to influence the outcome of what was happening in Arnhem in the way in which perhaps he should. Throughout the battle, the Germans would prove very adept at organizing themselves into ad hoc fighting units. The German ability to organize and create these, these ad hoc battle groups was a significant, had a significant impact on what happened. It's important to bear in mind, however, that the effectiveness of those ad hoc battle groups would vary with the quality of the individual soldiers contained in them. And while that might seem like a self-evident statement, and, and indeed it is, uh, the fact remains that there was, there's a significant difference between the ability of the German staff to organise things and on paper make them look as if they will work, and to have the non-commissioned officers and junior officers in place to actually make them work on the ground. And, and that's, in a sense, why the lower grade soldiers, although properly organised into battle groups, were effective, let's, let's be in no doubt. Lack of coordination and control, and, and that's a feature of the fact that they weren't properly formed units, not properly formed divisions, they didn't have the radios and so on and so forth, because they did very well with what they had, would have affected adversely their ability to conduct operations. With the Waffen SS who were here, the 9th SS in particular, whose, whose focus was on the perimeter, uh, they were given orders by their officers to junior non commissioned officers, more or less march to the sound of the guns, and when you do something, when you get there, do something. Uh, knowing full well that when they got there, they were trained, competent, and aggressive enough to physically do something which would have an impact on operations. And indeed, Sepp Kraft's stopping of, of the move of the Airborne Division by ambush, getting himself into position, putting out the early patrols, stopping uh, Freddie Goff's 
Jeep Squadron with that first ambush and then slowing down the 3rd Parachute Battalion with his left-hand company. Really, a significant effect purely on the initiative of a junior German officer and junior non-commissioned officers who just did what they were trained to do to the standards that they were trained to do them, which were very high indeed. By the end of the first day, the Paris had had mixed fortunes. The 1st Battalion had been due to advance along the northern Leopard route, but it had run into the Recce Squadron, who informed them that there was a great deal of resistance ahead. In order to try and outflank the Germans, 1st Battalion headed north towards the Amsterdamsweg main road. But the lightly armed airborne soldiers met German infantry, supported by tanks. With no means of fighting armour, the Paris abandoned the main road and tried to press on through the woods. The 3rd Battalion, following the Middle Tiger route, was also having a difficult time and was locked into a firefight in woods that would last for several hours. In order to try and outflank the Germans, C Company was ordered north to follow the railway line to the bridge. Although C Company would succeed in getting through, their progress was fraught with difficulty. So we got down that steep slope onto the railway line and we began moving on towards Arnhem. Now, any one of you that have walked along railway lines will know that they are spaced wrongly. You cannot march properly. I mean, you're going along like this. So my dear, so it's, it's that sort of a movement all the time. But there was one important thing we learned very early on, and that was instead of having the rifle slung on the right-hand shoulder, onto the left, because the signal wires were down there, and if the butt struck the signal wires, it yang, 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 sending a telegram forward to anybody who was up there. Second Battalion, commanded by Lieutenant Colonel John Frost, were advancing along the southern Lion route and had made much better progress. The route took them along the banks of the Rhine, where Dutch civilians poured out of their houses to press refreshments on the men as they marched. One of the battalion's first objectives had been to capture the rail bridge which traversed the Rhine at Oosterbeek. This would then enable the battalion to advance towards Arnhem on both sides of the river, so that both ends of the road bridge could be taken. C Company was detached to take the rail bridge. But as the men approached, the Germans detonated charges, demolishing the centre span. The bridge was abandoned, and the column, almost a mile in length, continued its march towards Arnhem. By the time it was getting dark at seven, A Company had reached the northern end of the bridge. Having advanced through houses and gardens to avoid costly confrontations, the Paris found the bridge lightly defended. But attempts to take the southern end were defeated. The paint of the bridge was ignited during the attempt, then a column of German lorries added to the inferno when it was attacked as it tried to cross the bridge from the south. Meanwhile, to the south, the 101st Airborne Operation just to the north of Eindhoven had gone well, and most of the division's objectives had been achieved by four o'clock in the afternoon. But at Son, a handful of German trainees blew the bridge that spans the Wilhelmina Canal just as the paratroopers arrived. This was the only crossing point, and so the advance stalled while they waited for 30 Corps' heavy bridging equipment to arrive. By the time a new bridge had been laid, 30 Corps were 36 hours behind schedule. Further north, the 82nd's attempt to capture its bridges also met with mixed fortune. Rather than try and take the road bridge at Nijmegen, the division's efforts were directed to securing the Grisbeck Heights some five miles away. It had been feared that a large German force might be assembling in the heights, and given that the high ground overlooked the route being taken by 30 Corps, great importance was attached to their capture. It was a costly distraction, which would cost the 82nd and 30 Corps dearly, in terms of time and men. It required the firepower of 30 Corps' armour and an almost suicidal river assault, something that airborne troops were not trained for, before the bridge at Nijmegen was captured on the evening of Wednesday the 20th. If you look to your left, you can see some power lines going across the river. They come back to a power station, which is just out of your sight, but you can see part of the structure down at the end of this row of houses. And it was from that power station that the boats were launched. Why were they launched in the first place? The reason is that Gavin was in trouble. He'd lost 300 dead or wounded. He'd lost 700, God knows where. 
His third lift wasn't coming in because of uh, trouble uh, in the UK airfields due to fog. The same thing was afflicting uh, the Poles trying to land north of here at Arnhem, which is just about 11 miles in that direction. And at the same time, between here and Vagel, which was the town we got meshed around in as we were trying to find our way up here, the Germans were trying to break through. So he was having to look over his shoulder at what was going on behind him and look forward at what he was trying to achieve in front. And he decided that the only way to cross this river and get these bridges was to take them at both ends and bounce a river crossing. So he ordered the 504th to do it. And the attack was led by two companies, H and I companies of the US 504th Parachute Infantry in British boats, 19 feet long, 13 men to a boat, equipped with three paddles. And the reason for the three paddles was that three people came with each boat and they were the crew. Because once the boat had got across the river, it would have to get back and you needed a crew to do that. And these were canvas and plywood boats, flat bottomed, which the Americans had never seen before. Julian Cook. Uh, described it uh, as on-the-job training. And they launched their boats <coughs> with the Irish guards along the side of this bank firing smoke from their tanks onto the river on the other side to try and obscure uh, the vision and the view of the Germans who could see these tanks crossing the river, uh, these boats crossing the river. Speaking to an American who was involved in that attack and asking him how thick the smoke screen was, there was a group of 40 people and he said if you all lit up a cigar now, there would be more smoke than we had on the day. By an immense stroke of luck, the charges that the Germans had laid on the bridge failed to detonate as the first British tanks began to cross. But time was running out for the men of the 1st Airborne Division at Arnhem. By dawn on Monday the 18th of September, it was clear that the men of the 2nd Battalion holding the northern end of the bridge at Arnhem were completely surrounded. Nevertheless, confidence was high for their numbers had been increased during the night by the arrival of reinforcements from 1st and 3rd Battalions. In all, there was a force of 740 men in positions in the buildings around the bridge's northern ramp. You'll gather that if you're in urban fighting, there's only one place to be and that's indoors whether it's raining or not, it's the best place to be, and rather than outside, trying to get in. Because the Germans did try, all the way through that Sunday night, and Monday, and Tuesday, the attacks went on incessantly, and so did the noise. Uh, you, you couldn't uh, just stop and quietly start thinking, really, about much, because of this deafening noise all the time with the small arms fire, the machine gun fire, with the mortar bombs, with the shell fire, because uh, the, the chap is the other side of the river, those guns were firing at us, as well as the mortars, uh, and we, so we had to tension and retension ourselves with that. Well, I had, uh, as all the officers had, uh, a, a little bottle full of benzodrine pills, <coughs> which we could pass out if we thought necessary. Well, I offered them round at one point, and quite rightly, the lads all refused them, because if they had taken them, as I knew, and I didn't take mine either, uh, you see, a German behind every blade of grass. You get over, over hype, so you'd, you'd rather better not have them. It was now a case of holding on until the rest of the division arrived. And at this stage, their commander, Lieutenant Colonel John Frost, had no reason to suspect that this wouldn't happen within a matter of hours. Repeated attacks by German infantry had been repelled with a force that left them in no doubt about the quality of the men in front of them it would take artillery and armour to blast the paras out of the houses. At about 9.30, 22 vehicles of the 9th SS Reconnaissance Battalion returned from Nijmegen and attempted to charge across the bridge. The attack was foiled by British mines, anti-tank guns and grenades, leaving the northern ramp partially blocked by burnt-out vehicles. Uh, on the Monday morning, we heard uh, sounds coming from across the bridge engines noises and somebody shouted that, that's 30 cor they've arrived uh, well we said let's wait and see and it wasn't because it was uh, it was the, the Victor Grabner's uh, recce uh, battalion and his scout cars came across the bridge about three or four of them uh, two parrot had pulled a string of mines across but uh, all by one of those scout cars managed to miss the mines and went over the bridge and on into the town they didn't get fired at too much because they came 
rather quickly before we were really ready for them. But they were followed fairly quickly after that with all the, uh, the uh, armoured type, the uh, uh, half tracks, open tops with crew, uh, soldiers in them and so on, uh, and two parrot who were much closer than we were, buildings right up to here, but we could see them uh, from our <coughs> first floor, we could see them, although we were some distance from them, and we fired down onto these chapters as well, and so many of the drivers of those vehicles were hit that the vehicles were meshed up together and uh, the dozen or more of them formed a complete block on the top end of the road, so nothing could get across one way or the other. Uh, and the crews of those uh, uh, vehicles were, were all killed. Some eight miles west of Arnhem, the two battalions of the 1st Air Landing Brigade that were defending the drop zones were awaiting the arrival of Brigadier Shan Hackett's 4 Para Brigade in the second major lift of the operation. Unfortunately, the Germans had discovered a map in a wrecked glider near Nijmegen. It detailed everything about the market garden plan, including when and where subsequent supply drops would come. How or why the map came to be in the glider in the first place remains a mystery to this day, but it meant that 4 Para was in for a very rough reception. This is South Ginkle Heath. It's this vast area was the dropping zone on the second day of the operation for the 2,500 men of the 4th Parachute Brigade. Their equipment in gliders would land on the same dropping zone as the 1st Parachute Brigade had landed on the previous day, and by road, that's about five miles away from here, although the distance across country is somewhat shorter. And the task since the previous evening, the first night of the operation, the 17th of September 1944, of the 7th Battalion of the King's Own Scottish Borders had been to defend this area, to protect it, to prepare the area for the landing of the 4th Parachute Brigade. But of course, in being here, they alerted to the Germans to the fact that there was a purpose for their presence, and that purpose could only be subsequent airborne landings, and the Germans set about bringing to bear forces from the east, from the west, and from the north to try to prevent the drop from occurring successfully, to try and break it up at that most critical time in a parachute landing, the moment when people exit the aircraft, have hit the ground, and are trying to organize themselves ready to conduct operations. The trip over was smooth, Pumpy, bit pumpy, but smooth over the channel. And eventually we came to the, the, the time when the, the, the crew said, like, you know, we'll be jumping in a minute. Meanwhile, we started coming under small machine gun fires, which we thought was Spando, and 88 millimeter anti-tank guns. And the first thing I was aware of, or the next thing I was aware of, was that the port engine was shot out and the starboard engine was on fire on the other side of the aircraft. Half a dozen or more of the chaps were dead, as far as I could see, on the floor, killed by small arms machine gun fire. And I was a bit worried whether we were all going to get out alive because the plane was going down fairly fast. In fact, I believe it was no more than above 350 to 400 feet from the ground when we eventually bailed out. But it was that or go in with it, of course. It's a vast area, and really, the King's Own Scottish Borders, despite their best efforts, could only achieve local success. The net effect was that when the 4th Parachute Brigade landed, it was, in effect, an opposed landing, and there were a considerable number of casualties from the fire which was put down by the Germans, by both small arms and mortars, on the heath. And it is a true heath, unlike Rankham, where the first parachute brigade had landed in that this is composed of heather and dry grass and therefore burned very successfully. In burning it caused huge problems of smoke obscuration not just for our own soldiers but for those of the Germans and of course did considerable damage to wounded soldiers many of whom were quite badly burned some of whom died in the most horrid circumstances, being incapable of escaping from the flames uh, as they gradually grew closer and closer to them. Despite the strength of the German defence, the entire 1st Airborne Division had now landed in Holland and the full weight of its effort could be put into the push to reach the bridge at Arnhem. Having arrived, they set off into the town, moving towards 
the East. It's perhaps important to remember in all this discussion of the impact and the effect of various things on the Germans is that there are clear German reports of the impact of the sudden arrival of the 4th Parachute Brigade which changed the balance of the number of manoeuvre units based on a battalion which were ranged against the Germans. And there are reports of uh, a number of German officers who were deeply concerned that the weight of force which was being delivered against them was more than they would be able to bear and that actually this attack by this elite airborne division was going to be something they would have great difficulty in overcoming if indeed they could overcome it at all. In the early hours of Tuesday morning, the airborne forces attempted to break through to the bridge and relieve their increasingly beleaguered comrades. The 3rd Battalion was the first to try in the early hours. They got as far as the St Elizabeth Hospital before running into a fierce German blocking line. With only 50 men left, it was clear that the 3rd Battalion was not going to be able to get through on its own. As they were withdrawing, the men of the 3rd ran into the men from the 1st Battalion, who were advancing along the river embankment. They were to be supported later by the South Staffords, who were to advance along the other side of the road. In the darkness, all seemed to be going well. But as daylight beckoned, they were spotted by German positions up on high ground in front of them and to the left. To make matters worse, they were then spotted by German positions in brickworks on the south bank. The airborne men were completely hemmed in as machine guns and mortars swept their positions from three directions. Although it must be said, and it is perfectly clear, they gave the Germans a hell of a fight and they came very close indeed uh, to doing it. But with only an officer or two and half a dozen men left alive or standing on their feet by the time they'd reached the German position, they really didn't have enough strength. To, to, to sustain a push through the German positions and then move on beyond it and do anything sensible in the area of the bridge. They were literally down to a handful of men. Large numbers of casualties were taken before the airborne troops withdrew. The one positive note in an otherwise darkening picture was that the South Staffs had managed to temporarily liberate the house in which Major General Urquhart was hiding, enabling him to escape and return to his divisional headquarters in the Hartenstein but it was the end of the 1st Para Brigade's attack at Arnhem. For the men at the bridge, the situation was getting desperate. The Germans, realizing that the British tanks intended to cross at Nijmegen, needed to get reinforcements south as quickly as possible. But most of those reinforcements were to the northwest of Arnhem. The paratroopers on the bridge, therefore, had to be removed as quickly as possible. Tanks were brought in to blast each house in which the Paris were hiding at point-blank range. They had originally gone to Arnhem with rations for 48 hours. Now, three days later, the Paris were running out of everything. Food, water, and above all, ammunition. They faced a stark choice. Surrender or die. We left the building. We were being hit again with mortars and machine guns. And the company commander said, this is pointless. We must surrender. We're not having any more killed. And so somebody put the flag up and somebody did. I don't know who, who or what or why, because that time I was still, I won't go back and say any more how it happened, but, but I was concussed uh, and not really fully conscious. Uh, so I've had this second hand from other people. But uh, the firing did stop uh, and we began to apparently uh, assemble ourselves together into a body. But then a German machine gunner fired. A, a, a burst at us and he only got time to do one burst at us because his offer, officer came, so I'm told, and began to kick the living daylights out of him because he fired after the white flag had gone up. But anyway, we, uh, we, we, uh, the company commander had said there is no point in carrying on and that was the whole bit behind it. You, you fight while you can. No food, no water, so what? That didn't matter. No ammunition. That's the important bit. We had no ammunition. We had no chance. So why carry on fighting with your fists or knives or whatever? So he said, surrender. Eight miles away to the north of Oosterbeek, the 4th Para Brigade was attempting a breakthrough. But they had come up against a tough German blocking line of the 9th SS Panzer Division, reinforced by armoured cars, self-propelled guns and anti-aircraft guns. The 10th Battalion began to attack the northern end, while the 156th Battalion advanced on their right. 
But against such firepower, the Paris stood little chance. And despite making a bayonet charge, they made no progress at enormous cost in casualties. The third lift had also been planned for Tuesday. Major General Sozabowski's Polish brigade had been due to drop a mile south of the Arnhem Bridge. But the gliders carrying the brigade's vehicles and anti-tank guns were to be dropped on the same landing zone used by the 4th Brigade, some eight miles away north of the river. To make matters worse, dense fog meant that the aircraft carrying the parachutists had to abort their mission, although 43 gliders managed to get airborne at midday. In Holland, divisional headquarters at the Hartenstein were unaware of these developments. But by the time the gliders arrived, the 4th Para Brigade had been forced to withdraw. With German forces snapping at their heels, there was confusion on the landing zone. British and Polish soldiers exchanged fire, resulting in casualties on both sides before order was restored. It was essential that they got themselves and their equipment over onto the south side of the railway line as quickly as possible. They would then be able to make their way to Oosterbeek, where the rest of the division was gathering. The only available route across the railway line was through a drainage tunnel a quarter of a mile east of Wolfhazer. So by Tuesday, that's the third day, and in the afternoon between, say, 3 and 6 o'clock in the evening, there were the soldiers of the 10th Parachute Battalion, 156 Parachute Battalion, and the 7th King's Own Scottish Borders, and some Poles who'd also landed with their heavy equipment on the Tuesday, all mixed up in this melee, trying to make their way across this railway embankment under that tunnel through which it's possible to drive a six pounder jeep uh, um, through which it's possible to drive a willis jeep towing a six pounder provided you drop the windscreen of the jeep because the pressure was coming from behind me to the east from the division von tetau and coming from the left of me from the north by the 9th ss division and other battle groups that were being formed to try and squeeze and compress the fourth brigade they couldn't get back to the Wolfhazer level crossing because of German opposition. And if you look at that railway embankment and see what a significant obstacle to movement it is to soldiers on foot, let alone people trying to drive vehicles, you begin to realise that 4th Brigade was effectively being boxed in and would have been incapable of escaping from it had it not managed to break south. But of course, in getting over that railway embankment, they exposed themselves to German machine gun fire. Uh, the withdrawal was such that it had to be done in haste. A withdrawal is probably the most complex military operation uh, there is going to be done effectively. It requires a lot of planning. This one couldn't be planned because of time constraints. Uh, and it was done in contact with the enemy, which makes a withdrawal even more difficult. Someone pressed a panic button. We was all told to withdraw en masse. We get down to the railway at Wolfshazen, and by that, the other side of it is on the bank, and there's these little tunnels or culverts underneath there, so people can walk through. And you're getting, you know, we, we all went, we didn't know who was giving the order, we just followed the man in front. Uh, chaps were trying to drive jeeps over railway lines, and God knows what. And we go on this coal, and we double back on ourselves on the other side of the railway. But nobody knew what was going on, it was all mishmash. Uh, junior officers didn't know because they couldn't find senior officers. Senior officers didn't know, but what we didn't know at the time, that because the general had been hiding out cat or in Arnhem, the brigade didn't know what was going on. So really, it was a whole mess up. We just followed the man in front. What did we did? You follow? Those jeeps towing trailers and guns, and those individuals who on foot could make it through this tunnel did so and broke out in the open ground here to the south of the Wolfhazer railway line to be joined by soldiers who'd made their way across the embankment to my left and to my right and were spewing down the sides of the embankment having survived the heavy machine gun fire and mortar fire which the Germans were able to bring to bear on them and which cost so many of them either injuries or indeed their lives as they tried to cross the very exposed line of the railway uh, which sits above us here. And Moving down here into the south area of the, uh, the area to the south of the Wolfhazer railway line on that Tuesday night, Brigadier Hackett consolidated what was left of his brigade uh, whilst he tried to work out how best he was going to draw them together and take them down as a cohesive whole uh, to join the perimeter, the Oosterbeek perimeter, the first airborne division perimeter that at that stage was beginning to firm up uh, around the Hartenstein Hotel headquarters and which lies uh, just a couple of kilometres uh, away, uh, slightly left of where I'm standing here.
Fighting at the bridge came to a close during Wednesday. The Paris defensive positions around the bridge were now isolated from each other. Some fought on with knives or their bare hands, but their situation was now hopeless. There would be no last-minute rescue by 30 Corps. Ironically, just as German armour began heading south over the Arnhem Bridge, so the bridge at Nijmegen fell into Allied hands, and 30 Corps was once again on the move, heading north. Realising that there was no hope of reaching the bridge at Arnhem, Major General Urquhart decided on a change of tactics. Now his priority was to form a defensive pocket around the Oosterbeek area, with its rear to the river. In this way, the airborne men would be able to survive for a longer period. And should 30 Corps find a way through, then the area would form a vital bridgehead on the north side of the river. Operation Market Garden could still be a success. Gradually, what was left of the 1st Airborne Division began to form a defensive perimeter. The eastern side was defended by remnants of the 1st Para Brigade, 11th Battalion, who had arrived on the 2nd lift, and what was left of the South Staffords. They had withdrawn from Arnhem with the Germans hot on their heels, forcing them to fight tanks at point-blank range. After the attempt by infantry battalions to get to the bridge at Arnhem and its lack of success, the remnants of those battalions were making their way back along this road into the Oosterbeek perimeter and gradually being pulled together and formed up into an organisation which was known as Lonsdale Force. And part of that structure was an anti-tank gun detachment of the South Staffordshire Regiment, which was at this road junction. One gun immediately behind me here in the raised garden to my left, facing down the road the way the soldiers had come, and one gun in the garden to my right, looking up the road to my right to protect against advancing armour coming down the road. The gun behind me, Sergeant Jack Baskerfield's gun, was put out of action and the crew were either wounded or killed, whereupon Baskerfield himself crawled across the road to the other gun, which was still functioning, but the crew had been killed or wounded, and he began to service that gun and fire on enemy armour coming down the track from the right towards where I'm now standing. After a short period of time, uh, a, a firefight between the tanks and Jack Baskerfield's gun, the tanks regrettably prevailed, and a main armament shot from the tank decapitated Jack Baskerfield uh, and he was awarded, as a result of his actions, one of the five Arnhem VCs. Partly, I'm tempted to suggest, because not only the bravery of his action, but the fact that the example he set is clearly recorded as having had its impact on the soldiers around him, made them both angry and upset, and quite determined to avenge his death, and therefore men who might otherwise have considered withdrawing remained where they were, in order to, as it were, do justice to his memory and to his loss. They eventually took up positions around a little church on the outskirts of Oosterbeek. This is the uh, Oosterbeek Lark Church. It's one of the oldest churches of its type in Holland and it was the centre really of the creation of Lonsdale Force where the soldiers who were coming down the road, this road that's on our left hand side from Arnhem, having been bashed and beaten trying to make their way to the bridge, were eventually reassembled into a cohesive organisation under the second in command of the 11th Parachute Battalion, a man named Major Dickie Lonsdale, and hence became known as Lonsdale Force, and they protected for the rest of the battle from the 20th, 21st onwards, uh, the bottom right-hand corner, the southeast corner of the Oosterbeek perimeter. You can see from the condition the building's in, the amount of fighting that took place here. And in fact, there was quite a lot of damage, and the tower, if I, my memory serves me right, was actually very badly damaged and had to be replaced. But the church itself, inside, um, withstood all that because the walls are pretty thick uh, and the damage which is done to the outside is actually largely cosmetic. Structurally, it's still very sound and survived. To the west, 4th Para Brigade was having an equally difficult time getting into the perimeter. Some men of the 10th Battalion had made it through, but the rest of the brigade was trapped in a hollow in some woods a few hundred yards from the perimeter. For eight hours they endured constant bombardment until, fixing bayonets, they made a desperate charge for the perimeter. Fourth Parachute Brigade overnighted the 19th, 20th of September just south of the Wolfhazer level crossing and the following morning, the 20th of September, decided to make the move to their southeast uh, into the then forming Oosterbeek perimeter. And in doing so they came through these woods. Uh, they met Germans, they were split and broken up and what was left of 156 Parachute Battalion plus the brigade headquarters with the brigadier Sean Hackett, ended up in a large dip in the ground, about 200 to 300 metres to the northwest of the, of the perimeter. 
There was a huge firefight in here. It went on for most of the day, as you can see from the uh, marks on the various trees around about the place. The bullet holes in what were then saplings are now large scars in what are now very large trees. Um, at the end of the day, uh, the firefight being too much and having either lost through death or wounding half of the 150 men with whom he'd gone into that hole, Brigadier Hackett decided he was going to leave it as fast as he could. He got everybody on their feet, they fixed bayonets and they charged with a humongous roar down the two to three hundred yards to their southeast into the Oosterbeek perimeter and barged their way into the lines which were then being defended by A Company of the Border Regiment. Whereupon Geoffrey Powell and his soldiers, having appeared and having had a very, very rough time indeed amongst soldiers who were dug in properly into a defensive position and, and sorted themselves out and settled down, the captain of the Border Regiment who met Geoffrey Powell's men came, coming through invited him to remove his scruffy lot unless they contaminate his own soldiers. And Geoffrey Powell and the balance of 156 Parachute Battalion went on down into the Oosterbeek perimeter and took up a defensive position along its eastern edge. Of the 2,170 men of the 4th Parachute Brigade who had left England two days previously, just 500 were left. On Thursday morning, the Germans began concentrated attacks on airborne positions in Oosterbeek. One of the most catastrophic losses was the only high ground in the area, the Westerbauwing. The Westerbauwing is a hill feature. It's about 32 metres above the level of the River Rhine, which you can see behind me. Uh, and its significance is that it lay in the south-western uh, or bottom left-hand corner of what eventually became the Oosterbeek perimeter or the Oosterbeek thumb, as it's referred to uh, in many of the history books. Behind me on the river line, you can also see the Driel Ferry. Uh, which today is a ferry only for cyclists and for foot passengers, but during the war was capable of taking vehicles. Uh, a ferry whose use was ignored by the British, uh, Urquhart later to say that he knew it was there, but it wasn't in his orders and therefore he never seriously considered making any use of it. The importance of the feature that we were on is that it dominates the area uh, along the bottom edge of this thumb through which one of the main thoroughfares runs. It was the route taken by the 2nd Parachute Battalion on their way to the bridge. And were they to be able to seal off the bottom of this thumb, the Germans would isolate the British Airborne Division to the north of the Rhine, render its rescue virtually impossible, and really annihilate it at will. So the key significance of what was up here was this ability to take out the bottom end of the Oosterbeek thumb. The loss of the Westerbauwing also had a major impact on Sozobowski's Polish paratroopers, who finally managed to jump into battle on Thursday afternoon. Their drop zone had been moved to Driel, south of the river, directly opposite the Westerbauwing. The plan had been for the Poles to cross the river using the Driel ferry and reinforce the British on the northern bank. But the Germans now had a commanding view of the area, and any crossing would be all but impossible. You only need to stand on something like the Vesta Bowering where you can see the left and right uh, boundaries of the perimeter to realize just how short those distances are. From up here, with a machine gun, you're well in range of a German light machine gun to the far side over there of what was the perimeter of uh, the Airborne Division and the line down which they would eventually uh, evacuate. Indeed, from up here, you're almost within good, accurate basic rifle range and certainly sniper rifle range uh, for anybody trying to get across the open fields and across the river to the south and away to Nijmegen, which is to our south uh, and away behind me here. Uh, and it's, it's a, a constant source of amazement to me, really, in a sense, that you can stand up here and look so easily uh, and see so clearly, almost within stone throwing range, uh, the very narrow perimeter into which uh, uh, this airborne division was eventually constrained. The arrival of the Poles caused the Germans to reassess their tactics at Oosterbeek. Troops were sent south of the river to prevent the main Nijmegen road falling into the Poles' hands. The British had also by now established contact with 30 Corps and were able to direct artillery fire onto German positions, which in some places were within yards of the airborne men. Just here we're driving down Station Way, which is the eastern or right-hand side of the Oosterbeek perimeter, and we're heading from the north to the south. And really, 
the point to stress about this road is that this was the front line, effectively, that we're driving along with British paratroopers, glider pilots, uh, and recce squadron and other soldiers in the houses and the buildings that were there at the time on our right hand side and German soldiers principally SS uh, from the 9th SS on the left hand side of the road firing at each other killing each other destroying each other at the ranges that you can see which are no more than the distance it takes to cross a single suburban road. Note as we're going by the fences, the hedges the neat little gardens, the walls, and all the things which made it extremely difficult for both sides to conduct low-level tactical operations in this area. Street fighting in Oosterbeek was extremely difficult. The Germans continued to probe the perimeter for areas of weakness. Snipers and tanks roamed the front line, taking advantage where they could. But the airborne men were not ready to give up yet. The Western perimeter of the Oosterbeek defensive position was held in this area south of the Uda Herberg crossroads, now a roundabout, by the 1st Battalion of the Border Regiment. And the terrain to the left of the road where their defensive positions were is tree lined, heavily populated with trees, leafy glades, deep gullies, and really very difficult to defend in terms of visibility, ranges of weapons and the ability to find good defensive positions within it. They also had to cover an area which extended them beyond belief. There was no real line of sight communication between them and any chance of any level of mutual support that they might obtain was really out of the question. These leafy glades form part of the parkland which surrounds the Hartenstein Hotel the headquarters of 1st Airborne Division and form part of the park that lies within the boundaries of what became the Oosterbeek perimeter. To my right and about 700 yards away is D Company of the 1st Battalion of the Border Regiment and further round to my right and about 250 yards away is C Company of the 1st Battalion of the Border Regiment and they lie uh, on a line of a road which runs down the left hand side of the Oosterbeek perimeter and at 90 degrees to the position I'm standing now. Over my shoulder and through the trees, it's just possible to discern the houses in which were housed the battalion headquarters and the regimental aid post of the 1st Battalion, the Border Regiment. And it was from here that the battalion's efforts down the whole of that left-hand side of the perimeter were coordinated. In these woods, men fought from about the 19th of September 1944, the Tuesday, right the way through to the time when those who were evacuated managed to get out on the 25th. No food, no water really, other than that which they brought with them or were able to collect. Limited ammunition, only 7% of what was dropped ever arrived here. And yet within these woods and amongst these trees, a tremendous battle took place uh, in which the border regiment lost more killed than any other infantry battalion in the Battle of Arnhem, some 121 of their number. And one of the most evocative memories of the 1st Battalion of the Border Regiment and the fight they put up is the mortar crew commanded by Corporal Jim McDowell with uh, Private Ginger Tierney as one of his uh, helpers whose face uh, is writ large in the photographs of the battle that are shown in most of the books and in most of the movie newsreels. And the trench from which they fired it, the mortar pit as it's known, from which they fired their mortar still remains to this day as a depression in the ground. And it was from here for the whole of the four days that they provided fire support with what limited ammunition they had to C Company and D Company, only 250 and 700 yards away. And in so doing, they virtually had to remove all of the augmenting cartridges from the mortars to minimize the range. And the mortar tubes, when they fired them, would have actually been lobbing the bombs vertically in order to get inside the minimum range requirements of the weapon. The biggest problem facing the airborne troops was dwindling supplies. During the operation, the pilots and dispatchers in the aircraft of RAF 38 and 46 Group made countless attempts to get supplies to the increasingly beleaguered troops on the ground. But the drop zones were still in German hands, added to which they knew how to copy British recognition signals. Their courage and sacrifice was often in vain, 
as the supplies invariably dropped into German hands. An interesting thing during this time, by the way, uh, when I um, climbed up and said, no, we're dropping supplies. And we were told that when the uh, planes come out, hold out your recognition scarves and they will drop these supplies to you. Well, what we didn't know was, for some strange reason, the Royal Air Force were told not to recognise these scarves. So, of course, they were dropped at pre-arranged supply drops. Hence, we found out the Germans got 98% of them. Cigarettes, everything. We got a pannier in one day with blood, a pannier like a hamper, with, stacked with blood plasma and no way to administrate it unless you drunk the stuff. Uh, Pyjamas. Uh, we had containers where we believe they were packed prior to D-Day, where you got brain guns come out and the magazines filled. You fired the first round and there's just a stoppage. Pulled the magazine and the rounds just dropped out. Because they're putting 28 in, they packed in 30. They've been packed for months. So there was all these problems arising when you could get them. I did go to cut a container down. Um, I climbed this little, well, small oak tree. I was in was cutting through the web in this container when I got fired upon. I dropped the knife, my fighting knife, in the story. Uh, 35 years later, it was found in the same area, and I've got it hanging up indoors now. We were very concerned. That it was it was heartbreaking and very emotional to see an aircraft dropping stuff and going on after the drop into the ground where it had been shot down the bursting into flames. Very emotional. For three days, the airborne men around Oosterbeek held out, despite being continuously bombarded by German artillery. But early on the morning of Monday the 25th, Urquhart received the worst kind of news. 30 Corps had abandoned any hope of reaching the 1st Airborne Division and that he was to withdraw his men across the river. Behind me is the River Rhine. On the far bank you can see the dike with traffic running along it. It's a beautiful summer's day. Farmers are harvesting crops through the smell and the sound of a late August afternoon. It's very peaceful. On the night of the 25th, 26th September 1944, it was quite different. Pitch dark, pouring with rain, the most abject weather conditions, as the soldiers of the 1st Airborne Division made their way down through the houses and the pathways in the town of Oosterbeek and the surrounding parkland, which lies to the north of where I am now, down paths and tracks like this to make their way to the near bank of the River Rhine on the flat fields behind me, where during the course of the night, something like just over 2,000 men waited patiently, tired, cold, soaked through, exhausted, not having eaten in many cases for four or five days, as boats manned by soldiers of the Royal Engineers and the Royal Canadian Engineers made their way to and fro across the river, picking them up and taking them away to safety and to the reception areas which were set up in the town of Nijmegen, which is about 17 kilometers to the south of here. Some lay down and slept and were still sleeping there the next morning. Others were woken and put into boats, still more decided they weren't prepared to wait for the boats and they tried to swim. Some were successful, some did not. Tim and I uh, decided to cross the river and I realized as soon as I got in the water that uh, started doing the overarm that there was no way I was going to cross the other, other side. Tim, my colleague, decided the same thing, so we went back into the woods. Uh, we were told to follow the white tapes, uh, which would be laid out en route to the river. Quite a simple thing, it appeared to be simple. Uh, we took our rifles and, having, and arms with us at that moment. We bound our feet, because being wooded, sort of been heavily mortared, there was a lot of brambles and noise. We then fell in single file, uh, like crocodiles, across the Arnhem Utrecht Road, through, remember this tape didn't actually follow roads, it was obviously going through back gardens, etc. That's the shortest distance between two points. If you want. Anyway, we followed the tape and we turned slightly right and all of a sudden, I suppose a German 
heard this noise. Trigger happy, opened up. Uh, the machine gun. When I realised that we going down to the river on the last day, we on the breakout. We had gone about three, four hundred yards, and I suddenly appreciated that we were in box fire. And I was in the middle of the box fire, people on my right, people on my left, people behind me. And I got message to people behind me to try and go back and detour around to come out to the other side and make their own way down. But I was too far in and I had already been wounded once in the shoulder to be able to lead them. And I thought, well, any good praying? No, I haven't paid my entry fee. I think about people? No, it's bloody ridiculous. Hope I don't make a fool of myself. By about four o'clock in the morning, it was over. By about four o'clock in the morning, those who could be rescued were rescued, and daylight meant that really there was very little chance of anybody else getting across a river which could be so easily dominated by then by fire from the Germans from the left and from the right of what had been the Oosterbeek perimeter. The withdrawal had been successful for a number of reasons. First of all, it was well planned. Secondly, the Germans who didn't like fighting at night anyway and tended to leave the airborne soldiers alone were even less inclined to be a nuisance during the course of the night because of the foul nature of the weather. And thirdly, because the withdrawal was covered by huge amounts of artillery fire from 64 medium regiment uh, south of here in Nijmegen and from the field artillery of the 43rd Wessex Division. And it was that noise, that huge volume of fire that was coming over that made the Germans themselves uncertain about what was happening, whether that was the prelude to a reinforcement or whether it might be the covering fire for withdrawal. And so although it was awkward, although it was difficult, and although some people were hurt, wounded, ambushed on their way down to the river, to a great extent, those unwounded soldiers who could get out, did get out. Those who remained behind were the padres and the doctors looking after those who couldn't make their escape, and also remaining behind were the wounded who themselves could not make it, maintaining fire positions, carrying on firing at the Germans, sending radio messages, keeping up all the appearances of an airborne division being still within the perimeter in order to allow their fellows to escape. And of course, the next morning, the Germans were able to come in, find that they'd been tricked, and those who'd stayed behind to help cover with the withdrawal, and those who'd stayed behind to look after the wounded were made prisoner and taken into captivity, a captivity that would last to the end of the war, which was still some nine months away. In the aftermath of the battle, the entire civilian population was driven out of the area, their homes looted by the Germans. Many thousands of Dutch civilians would starve to death in the winter of 1944, as the Germans refused to let supplies be distributed as a reprisal for the general strike called by the Dutch on the eve of Market Garden. In those days, we were getting hungry already, and, and later on we got the so-called hunger winter, the worst and the coldest winter of the whole war. And in the West, about 22,000 people starved to death because the Germans had forbidden the transport of all food from the East to the West. And the coal mines were in the South and had been liberated by the Americans, so we had no heat, we had no electricity, um, and only half an hour of water per day. And we ate, first of all, sugar beet, which is bad enough, and we ended up with tulip bulbs, and that's the worst thing ever. I still hate tulips. <laughs> and, and life has its ironies, you know. My wife is the daughter of a bulb grower. Film taken under fire in Arnhem tells its own story. Arnhem would not be liberated until the 14th of April, 1945. Just over 10,000 men landed at Arnhem during Market Garden, but barely 2,500 escaped across the river. Around 240 would later find their way home, thanks to the tireless efforts of the Dutch population. 
Nearly 6,500 were taken prisoner, which meant that some 1,300 men were killed. The Battle of Arnhem was hailed as a glittering success, and even Field Marshal Montgomery was said to be officially pleased with the outcome and believed that Market Garden had been 90% successful. Certainly in terms of amount of ground and bridges captured, it had been successful, but without the bridge at Arnhem, it was all for nothing. Dropping the 1st Airborne Division so far from its objective ignored all the lessons that had been learned about airborne warfare. Not being able to carry out the assault in one lift and the breakdown in communications that followed only compounded the problems. This defence here prevented the Germans from moving armour south and preventing the Americans finally from taking the Nijmegen Bridge. If Nijmegen, as the Germans believed, was the key to Arnhem, the defence of this end of the bridge by the paratroopers was the key to their failure to hold the Nijmegen bridge in the end because of the, the, the determination that they displayed in meeting their objective, which after all had only ever been to hold this bridge for two days, and they held it for nearly four with no ammunition, no resupply, no support and no help. But the men who fought at Arnhem are worthy of the highest praise. Today, the men of the 1st British Airborne Division are still remembered and honoured by the people of Oosterbeek and Arnhem. Well, I have the feeling that the population in this area was so delighted that after four years of German occupation, the liberators were finally there. That, I mean, they were overjoyed. And although the operation uh, went wrong, and although the area became German again, and although the civilian population had to uh, evacuate the area, the fact that this attempt was made, that the British tried to liberate this area, made an enormous impact on, uh, on the civilians here. But it was not only that, it was the fact that they lived through this dramatic battle together. I mean, it was not a battle of soldiers only. I mean, they, uh, they were con confined in, in, in a very small area, like, like in, 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 in these houses here, in the gardens here. They shared food, they shared water, uh, they looked after each other's wounded. Um, a very strong bond of friendship um, started to, uh, to develop. And I, I, I still remember um, my mother saying uh, how she admired these dashing young men who were always optimistic even in in the darkest hours of the battle they always um, were more or less convinced of the fact that they would win and that had a very positive effect on on the civilians so after the war when veterans came back um, they were very surprised that they were received here uh, with such warmth and friendship. Um, but that's caused by the fact that they tried to liberate this area uh, a year before.